Emil J. King is Program Director for the Arts and Culture at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, where he leads the grant making program that seeks to nurture exceptional creative accomplishments, scholarship, and conservation practices while promoting a diverse and sustainable ecosystem for the arts. Mr. Kang previously served as Executive and Artistic Director of Carolina Performing Arts at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a major multidisciplinary performing arts program he founded in 2005. While in that role, he oversaw, oversaw four venues and produced, developed, and presented works by artists from all over the world. He also served as professor of the practice in the Department of Music. In 2016, Mr. Kang was also named special assistant to the Chancellor for the Arts and founded Arts Everywhere, a major campus and community-wide initiative dedicated to integrating artistic practice, learning, and engagement in the lives of the entire community. Kang has also served as a member of the National Council of the Arts since 2012, having been nominated by former President Barack Obama. Kang also currently serves on the board of the Martha Graham Dance Company and the International Society of the Performing Arts. So take it away, Emil Kang. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, Viviana. Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, and thank you as well to my dear friends, Shanta, Isabel, and Bill for inviting me to join you here all today. I am zooming in from the unceded lands of the Eno, Shikori, and Okanichi peoples, otherwise known as Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I have lived for the last 16 years. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you, the artists and arts workers, for your courageous artistry and tireless work in filling our souls and raising our collective consciousness. As we seek meaning and try to make sense of our flawed societies, artists have never been more important to our world. We see and hear your persistent and inequitable struggle for resources and recognition. And all too often, the tragic persecution and suffering that artists face both here and abroad, often in the fight for freedom and the right to survive. I am the child of Korean immigrants from the Jinju clan of the Kang family. I can trace my family tree back to 698 AD. I'm a fifth generation firstborn son of parents who arrived in the US not speaking a word of English and who landed in a tiny apartment behind Jamaica Hospital on the Van Wyck Expressway in Queens, New York in 1968 when my mother was seven months pregnant just so that I might be born in the US. My heritage is my identity and it informs my work every day. I am a forever foreigner in a country that both affords and denies me privilege. I can walk into a hospital and the hallways will part like the Red Sea. People assume that I must be a doctor. But at a supermarket deli counter, employees will always first acknowledge and address my blonde haired wife. Maybe it's because I live in the South, but to this day, People still ask me where I learned to speak English so well. Like a good Asian stereotype, my formative years were spent in classical music, studying the violin, but that certainly was not my only interest. I still have the ticket stub to the Peter Gabriel concert in 1987, when as a college sophomore, I was introduced to the voice of Yu Thun Dur. I never would have imagined that nearly two decades later, I'd work with Yusu many times begin a friendship with him, and even travel with him across his home country, participating in the celebration of the Gamu. In 1993, I saw Angelique Kijo for the first time in Central Park, in 94 as well, and then ran to Tower Records afterwards to purchase, purchase a copy of Aye, again not knowing that I would work with her as well. Here's that CD. Speaking of the indomitable and inimitable Angelique Kijo, let me fast forward to the 2021 edition of Global Fest that she hosted so beautifully. Despite the limitations of a digital platform, the artists, Global Fest and Tiny Desk and NPR music teams delivered an extraordinary experience that was uplifting, yet intimate, and tremendously restorative. It was mana from heaven. My family and I danced to Vak Sambu, 
marveled at the young talent of Nora Brown and her deep respect for the history of Appalachia and cried over the majesty of Rokia Traore. Global Fest was healing salve following the seditious insurrection that occurred just days earlier at the US Capitol. In addition to the artists who graced our screens, I'd also like to give a specific shout out to all the folks behind the scenes, the producers, engineers, and crew who made this year's Global Fest second to none. I am so proud and grateful to Global Fest for introducing me over many years to so many musicians and creative professionals from around the world. Individuals continue to persevere and inspire even in this very moment. The challenges that our ecosystem faces today are especially great, seemingly insurmountable. As if life in the gig economy alone were not precarious enough, tours and contracts continue to be canceled, long-standing methods of interacting with one another, with the communities we care about and with audiences have been impossible. We know that the unemployment rate for musicians in the US alone stands at nearly 30%. In addition to a raging pandemic, we face a climate crisis and the perpetual and deeply rooted structural racism that has plagued our nation for hundreds of years. We fight for an unapologetic redress of long, long standing inequitable access to resources and healthcare, housing and education among many others. And I know that many of you are at the forefront of this work. And you know that one individual, one group, one country cannot face these challenges alone. They, may, they must be faced collectively and yet each of us must do our part. Differences cannot divide us, and thus Global Fest's mission to break down cultural and social boundaries through music and its values to be a driving force toward a society that values cultural diversity as a source of unity rather than division are more important than ever. Learning together is critical to, our, to moving our world toward one that is more just and more equitable, and achieving this through the arts and humanities is something that we believe in deeply at the Mellon Foundation. Our vision for the arts and culture program is to celebrate the transcendent power of the arts, to challenge, to activate, and to nourish the human spirit. In order to share how I think about artists and the challenges we face today, particularly in regards to equity and justice, please allow me to look back. Over the time I led Carolina Performing Arts, I began to confront the reality that my vision we had to center equity was continually being undermined by white-centered arts philanthropy and governance models, Eurocentric theater attendance rituals, and classist ticket selling structures. At Carolina Performing Arts, we sought alternatives and started experimenting on a small scale, like moving away from scaling the house or the general admission. And yet even something as simple as that revealed much larger systemic issues. Unbeknownst to me, for example, my well-intentioned development staff still felt compelled to reserve seats for our wealthiest white donors. Over time, I began to realize that if we wanted true equitable engagement with our communities, rewarding curiosity and discovery for all, we needed to reframe relationships between artists and audiences and acknowledge our role in the power dynamic with artists. At UNC, we began to shift resources and make multi-year commitments with a group of artists to experiment with new models of artist engagement that extended beyond singular performances or individual PL statements. This allowed for our communities to engage with in long-term multifaceted relationships with artists over time and over multiple forms of experiences. These included community song events, group suppers, sound and silence workshops, and even a book club. We committed to these artists over multiple years and asked them to spend weeks and sometimes months in our communities, however they saw fit. Each of these artists spent weeks at a time over a number of years and happily, this work continues to this day. And it does with artists like Toshi Reagan, Abigail Washburn, Shara Nova, Okwiokpokwasili and Helga Davis among others. Through these experiences, I realized that we had an opportunity to understand and begin to address the issues of equity that included, but went far beyond who was represented on our stages. 
While I was enthusiastic about our progress, I still bristled and choked on the layers of scarcity mentality, bureaucracy, and the cultural inertia within my own organization that I founded, and community, and also wondered about my own complicit behavior as an arts administrator. Though we persisted, we still struggled to fully adopt these more equitable models. And that's when I met Mellon Foundation President Elizabeth Alexander. She arrived at Mellon in 2018 and continues to lead our foundation, and I think philanthropy as a whole through transformational change. I was her first major hire. I went to Mellon because of a clear values alignment with Elizabeth and the major changes brewing there thanks to her leadership. Less than a year in, we announced our institutional pivot toward equity and justice. And since then, we've made significant commitments to some incredibly impactful initiatives, including our disability futures and monuments initiatives. New York Governor Cuomo also recently announced our developing partnership to help get thousands of artists back to work in New York State. At Mellon, we understand that in order to truly exemplify the values of equity and justice, who we support is just one part of the equation. Just like the example I gave as a presenter of who we presented on our stages, it was also just one part of the equation. As funders, we must also assess, recognize, and address the inequities of our practices thinking deeply about who has access to philanthropic resources, who has a seat at the table, and what equities are inherent in our proposal processes. Moreover, we must work across the ecosystem of our field to support equitable practices for artist managers and agents of color, creative producers, presenters, staff and board members of color, so that we can support communities with the entire ecosystem in mind. We must consider the non-arts players that influence our ecosystem including elected officials, regulators, even community development financial institutions. As I mentioned, we at Mellon announced our new strategic framework centering equity and justice this past June. As part of our framework, we are committed to systems change work in our field. We must understand and address the limitations of the traditional funder grantee model, as well as the nonprofit model. We are exploring ways to support individual artists, collectives, mutual aid societies, and even for-profit entities if we are to truly address issues of equity. As a funder, we must nurture relationships with artists and organizations and support them for their visions as opposed to looking at who else has funded them. We must address communities with specific intentionality and offer multiple forms of capital if we are going to truly help organizations thrive. Our work of change at Mellon is ongoing and we are learning as we are going. We don't have all the answers, but it is dramatically shifting our grantee pool, as it very well should. Through our work, we seek greater, we seek greater visibility, recognition, and resourcing resources for those artists, arts leaders, and organizations that represent and center BIPOC, LGBTQI, and disability communities. We seek increased opportunities for individual artists to continue working and leading the field despite pandemic limitations. We seek a proliferation of experiments and programmatic and business models in the arts that aim to be more equitable and inclusive, working at the intersection of, of arts and community thrivability. We seek a world in which artists have greater agency to act as vital social conscience and who represent the fuller range of lived experience particularly as it relates to the BIPOC, LGBTQI, and disability communities. And perhaps most importantly, we seek to foster an artist-centered society, one that we know will drive us toward a more just and equitable world. Artists will be the ones to lead us there, so our society must center the artist. And when I say center, I don't mean centering their work, their output alone. I mean centering artists as human beings with a great deal to contribute to our world. It's not just artistic output that propels us forward. It is their way of being and seeing the world. Through their practice, artists exemplify and teach us the importance of curiosity, empathy, and righteousness. Funders and presenters must create space for and center the full potential of an artist's contribution. 
this is our way forward. And we are seeing the impact already. Global Fest 2021 being just one example. While the past year has been devastating, we have seen tremendous innovation in the making and programming of art. The development of new business models, partnerships, and even contract contractual agreements. I look forward to seeing continued creativity and imagination from each of you, fully recognizing that this work is exhausting now more than ever. But I am fully confident that this energy of forward momentum will continue and that it will lift up this year's conference as well. I wish you all my very best as you continue to be curious, to explore, and to create together over the next two days. I look forward to learning from and alongside each and every one of you. Thank you. Emil, wow, thank you so, so much for framing this next two days with your words, your humanity. This is uh, such a beautiful and encouraging and inspiring way for us to kick things off. Um, I love the artifact that you shared. I'm sure everybody has that first ticket or that special something that connects them to why we're all here today gathered. Um, so that was really wonderful. And of course, addressing systemic issues, centering art and learning as we go. This is truly the moment for all of that. And thank you for, for being a leader and inspiring us all this afternoon.